You can't imagine my gratitude at this moment to be here with you and to respond to this wonderful theme as a convention, but more than that, to be in your presence and, of course, in the presence of our teacher, Father Thomas. So I'm going to start with a little tune and move <laughs> right into a presentation on a teaching um, that how do we live ordinary life with extraordinary love. Hi, watch out. Don't give up my day job, right? <laughs> so, again, that is the sentiment. How do we love? How do we love? And again, that wonderful theme that you chose about loving, uh, using our ordinary life, our ordinary life, with extraordinary love. A master teacher of that was Therese of Lisieux. And she, if she were here today, I envisioned, what would she want to tell you? What would she teach you? What would she say if she were here? Well, this, um, believe me, she's not an easy teacher, so hold on to your seats. She would say uh, that it's a way, it's a particular practice, and it's a particular practice of love. And so she opens up in her little autobiography and then in her letters, and then in her own life that people testified how to do this. Now, as you know, Therese was uh, just a Carmelite nun. She entered at age 15. She died at age 24. Uh, what does she know, huh? Um, but she was extraordinary. She was a spiritual genius. And there's two parts of her life that I want to elucidate because that gives me confidence in her that she's just like you, she's just like me, she, she knows our human predicament. Her mother died when she was four and a half years old. She was the youngest. She had uh, four sisters. Four other children died before her. Her mother had her when she was 41. And Therese was a spoiled kid. <laughs> French, kind of aristocracy, spoiled kid. And she had probably a four on the Enneagram. She had unbelievable sensitivities. Uh, she uh, needed in, uh, entirely 100% affirmation, attention. She couldn't even do her own hair when she went to boarding school at age 10, 12. She didn't know how to put up her hair, comb her hair, you know. And in fact, she was so neurotic, she uh, couldn't, go, couldn't go to school. She had to leave school and be tutored at home when one of her sisters left for the Carmelite Monastery, she went into a total funk. <laughs> now we're talking pretty, pretty serious stuff, head banging, uh, passing out, although she said she was alert, they, she was shaking, she was uh, delirious, she was uh, you know, in bed, kind of paralyzed here and there. 
Um, there's a movie coming out on her, and they're going to talk about her above the river. I hope they get at her under the river, too. But nevertheless, she had um, a very sensitive nature, and she was prone to mental illness, and, and uh, she was not a stable child after her mother died for about nine years. But then there's this famous story she tells of herself that she is going upstairs after midnight mass, Christmas 1886, the night of her conversion. And it's significant for our story today because she shifted that night. She had an enormous inbreaking of grace. And she shifted from a child to an adult. She shifted from self to selfless sacrifice. And she knew it, and everybody else were soon to know it as her life unfolded. Again, it was, she said that in that one moment, God did what she was not able to do in nine years of her willingness to change. She tried to change. She had bouts of scrupulosity. She, she truly was a sensitive child and loved God with her whole heart, but also was, as she said of herself, a brat. <laughs> so anyway, this night of conversion changed her. And when she, well, how it happened was she was going upstairs. Again, it's like many conversions. The story doesn't tell the underneath the river story. The, her father said, I, happily, this will be the last night we have to play Santa Claus. And, and she heard that, and she realized she was too old to be having her shoes filled with candy and come down and see the delight of it all. And so she had tears in her eyes going upstairs, taking off her hat. Celine said, oh, don't go downstairs. It'll be too hard on you. You're too delicate. And she said no, and she went down, and she played the part. But she was never the same. She said those words pierced her heart. Technical term for compunction, connexus, that compunction. She broke up. Okay? Now, all of us in this room probably have had a compunction experience. But how do you sustain awakening? That's the bigger job. Contemplative prayer opens us. And maybe we got into contemplative prayer because of a compunction, some kind of a piercing of our heart. But we stay open through the practices of contemplative prayer, through those practices you talked about on Thursday of welcoming, of Lexia Divina, you know, of hospitality, of the active prayer sentence. So I'm going to tell you today her practice that she taught, and it's called the little way, and it's a way of love. And again, it seems unfair to, although many of you already practice it, I know, because of your love and devotion to her and to her way, um, seems like a little ambitious in a 40 minutes to give you a new practice if it's new. But it's very available. Just read her biography uh, and a um, little section of it in Tools Matter. But again, you, you, to access a saint, they have a transmission through their own words, just like scripture. To hear those words directly in scripture are more powerful than anything. So what is the teaching of the little way? First of all, you are convinced of being little. That word little is a technical term. Therese felt like a child, and she decided to always be a child. Not childish, not, um, not regressive, but humble, simple, little. Little meaning I am little. And, and a conviction of being little, of I am nothing. There's nothing in me. So in her littleness, there's no shame, there's no embarrassment, there's no, uh, you can't surprise her because she always knows she's little. Should thoughts and feelings and emotions rise? Of course, because I'm so little, I'm so human. Little for her was a technical term that really means human. I'm just so human, I am little. And then once convicted of being little, she saw that God was great. And not in justice, she, God's mercy was what was so great. And the more little I am, the more endearing God is toward me as his creature. And the direct path of being the, the little way is to be as little as possible, to be very light. And I'm going to be very explicit in a moment about how to be light. These, this, there's a technology to her teaching that is just way beyond any theory I've ever uh, known. She's a saint of our times. So being little, because God is great. And then in being little, I'm lifted up in this direct way like an elevator. 
Now, another teaching from her life is she decided because she was little, she was not going to, it was a new way. The little way is a new way. She had no inclination towards corporal punishment, towards the old asceticism of flagellation or, or heavy-duty asceticism of saying so many prayers, doing so many prostrations, doing austerities, getting up in the middle of the night. She did none of that. She, her skillful means of being little was ordinary life. And ordinary life to her was affection, um, it was emotional. And her thoughts were thoughts about her experience. So thoughts and, and emotions, but her skillful means were her emotions, the way she felt, the way she, she reacted, the way her inner, under the river experience, how it affected her. And then that, that very affect is what she lifted up because she was so little, as little flowers to Jesus, to our Lord. And our Lord has many images. The one she liked best is out of the Gospel of John, but not leaning on his heart, more like coming up um, as a child, just being on him or with him. She was a spouse, she did, but her main image is just this little child, little child. Now, so the skillful means is her affect, her emotions. Her main two teachers were John of the Cross and the Imitation of Christ. Now, John of the Cross, as you know, is apophatic. Apophatic means uh, nada, going through nothingness, the spaciousness of being, to negate all, you know, to negate it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, and then let God be God, and then God emerges as God, and then the spiritual senses open up. So John of the Cross was a scholastic theologian, highly trained, very philosophical. He negated all his thoughts. Reminds me a little bit of somebody in this room. And, but he, he found God in, in a passionate uh, affectivity with this, uh, this undifferentiated presence of God. Now, Therese was the feminine counterpart to John of the Cross. Her apophaticism was to negate or to back out of her emotions. Now, we're not talking uh, denying her emotions or repressing emotions. or She used those emotions as her skillful means. Now again, that Christmas night where she had this conversion, this wake up, and she was changed. She grew up, she says. I no longer lived for myself. She shifted from selfing, that whole uh, insatiable desire for attention and love and, and absorption and nurturing. She shifted from that to sacrifice. And she sacrificed herself so selfless sacrifice is what, so instead of herself going up the chain of self through her emotions, she checked those self-returning emotions and offered herself in the spirit of sacrifice. I'm going to talk more about sacrifice. Isn't this good? Yeah. Pretty powerful stuff. Hmm. I got another tune in case we <laughs> Um so her, her, but what was unusual about that grace on Christmas night, did she get the grace of healing, her emotions subside, and being a completely healed, wonderful, adjusted human being? No, no, she still was neurotic, or had neurotic tendencies. She still was oversensitive, but she used that as her skillful means. That was her means to do ordinary things with extraordinary love. So how did she do this? All right, right, let's. she tells it of herself in her autobiography. She said, um, I um, would take, whenever I was irritated, my emotional program, and I would notice that I'd raise it up, and then I would uh, accept it, and then I would offer it to God like a flower, and then I would love that person. Outwardly, I'd love that person, even if inwardly repulsive. And then I would, I would take that repulsive feeling and I would offer that as a flower. And then I would love more. So the, she really had everybody destabilized. They didn't know who she loved and who she didn't. <laughs> we had one done like that in our community. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we don't have enough time to, to <laughs> go through all 82 of them. 
but there was one particular one when I was prioress that my subprioress and I, we decided that she is here for our salvation. <laughs> so we decided to particularly love her. And you know what happened? We did. We did. And, and it was genuine. Now she'll never know. And so do other people in the community. They just needed to see some people loving her, and then they started loving her. She thinks she's the most lovable person on the planet. <laughs> Now, between you and me, in the post there, she's emotionally six years old and has some other difficulties, which I will let her have in her own privacy of her heart. But she was a challenge. She was a load. But I learned to love through her. I learned to love. I can love, you know, with God's grace. God's grace. With, uh. Now, if you make a mistake in this little way, what is it? Well, I'm little, of course. Like, just recently, I've asked to get out of uh, uh, dishwashing with this one nun because I... I can't manage my thoughts. <laughs> so the little way is, well, just go in hum humility, say, you know, I can't do it. You know, until I grow enough in this love of this person, can you let me have a little space here? And next year, put me back on with her, and I'll see if God's grace is there. So the little way is accepting your littleness and just, you know, being humble and, and doing all those little things. Now, it gets more technical than this, meaning... The, she understood what she was doing when she did it. So she also knew it was a practice. It's something that you do. Now, it's more than an observance, meaning uh, people would just see it in you. Inside, you do this skillful practice. In other words, you are ready to love that Sister Joseph, love that Sister St. Pierre, love that Sister Emily. You know, you are ready. So I remember I was with the Dalai Lama, Thomas and I were uh, at a meeting and he was talking about his prayer day and he gets up early and goes through these mental afflictions and he takes on China every day and he forgives them for all this, you know, all the refugees and this and goes down, all this uh, obscurations he calls them. And then he looked over at me and he said, and if I'm in a good mood, I do yoga. I said, when the Dalai Lama's not in a good mood, we're in trouble. <laughs> So anyway, but that just means even the Dalai Lama has to practice every day in vigilance to anticipate the, the affect that will rise and to be present and to be vigilant and to know it and to use it as a skillful means to love. So you take this very um, antipathy, these very negative feelings. That's why it's apophatic. And her truth was not like John of the Cross with insight upon insight upon insight. Her truth was understanding the depth of her emotions more and more and more. Apophatic means, or at least in the mystical sense, in the light you see the light. You know, like when you walk into a dark house, you turn on the porch light, and then the hall light, and then the kitchen light. In each light, you see the light for the next room. You know, that's andagogical. That's trying to get there from light to light. Well, Therese did the same thing. With each emotion that she used, she saw another one deeper. Oh, I'm littler than I thought. <laughs> I'm, I'm really in more of need of God's mercy. So, and that is not to depress us. And then you feel depressed. Oh, I'm more depressed than I thought. <laughs> And then I'm more thinking about my depression than I thought I was thinking about my depression. So you see, her apophaticism was packing out the emotions with awareness, with genuine love and faith. Her faith was in God's mercy. Faith was in God's mercy. Her confidence, it was in God. Her, her, her conviction was in her littleness. So I am little, God is great, is the practice. It goes on. Uh, Let's talk about the idea that um, what she believed about God. Who was God for her? Well, again, you have to separate out the Therese of history, just like somewhat the Jesus of history in the Gospels, and the Christ in, in, of, of our times. In other words, what is the um, little Therese of history that is culturally conditioned in the 19th century France and in a Carmelite monastery? and in this part, I'd like to say that she probably would not appreciate us making her a cult, making her, isn't she cute, isn't she beautiful, isn't she, you know, that is not her message at all. Any cultish, any personality, personality. But what she is, is a way. She taught a way. And she, before she caught on to her little way, she first caught on that her vocation was love. It wasn't being a Carmelite. 
You know, she went and even asked the Pope to become a Carmelite at age 15, which was rather young. But she was spiritually pre precocious, but emotionally young. Um, but the idea would be her vocation was love. She realized that love transcends any particular vocation. So being married, being single. She never talked anybody into going to the convent. She never, she liked her missionary boyfriends, I call them, you know, the ones she wrote letters to. And believe me, they're great. That little book, Maurice and Therese, he was a bozo. He, <laughs> he had no idea who was writing him. I mean, he should have been on his knees. But he, he, played, he played a part of a foil so that she patiently taught him over and over again the little ways. That's a charming book. But nevertheless, it's not Therese as a person or a personality or to go to Lisieux to see her place. It's not even to read all the books about her, even the plays about her, and to wonder who she was, was she this, was she that. No, what she was is someone who discovered, like you and I have discovered or we wouldn't be here today, that our vocation, your vocation, my vocation, is really love, love. Love is the essence of a Christian. Who was Jesus the Christ? Not this man in Palestine. He was love incarnated in our midst. Jesus is love made manifest. And he brings us through his walk and talk and his words back to the Father through the giftedness of love, which is the Holy Spirit, the whole Trinitarian and triune experience we enjoy. So she understood her vocation was love. So then she, she wasn't over-identified, talking about disidentifying from your myth, um, with the Carmelites. Not really. She, she didn't, uh, there's not much about being a Carmelite in her book. It's about being, discovering love was her vocation. And then what does it take to love? Then her method of loving, her practice of loving, is this little way. Now I'm going to talk next about um, the actual... Uh, way you do this, you know, and she's got about 20 examples in her autobiography, and then it's highlighted by those letters to Celine, and, and she has some 54 poems, but, you know, really the poetry as such is not stellar. She, her practice, she doesn't want anybody pointing back to her, and that's a good teacher, huh? She wants people pointing toward, do what I say, because that's, this is how I found it. If you want to know how I found it, do this little way. Okay, what is that way and how did she do it? And then how have I watched people put that on in their day-to-day -day life? The little way is to take your ordinary experience and uh, just anything. Um, maybe think right now of just the last time you're irritated. Um, I wasn't on perfect pitch. <laughs> you know, if you're irritated or some kind of an emotional thing, something came to your awareness, maybe the person next to you. <laughs> Okay, so you, you note it, you just note it. Okay, then you bring it, you think it, imaging sort of in the way back of your mind, do not waste suffering. All suffering is to be offered, it is a skillful means towards my own transformation and transformation of others. So I would take that emotional program inside and I would note it and then I would offer it just little glance, little hint to God, to our Lord, to whatever image, and she had many, so you don't get stuck on just one. And then I would return, instead of returning my natural inclination of, would you shush a little bit, or you know, you know, you know, some irritation, you would return love, a glance, a thought, a, and just an affirm affirmation toward that person, toward that thing. And you would do it as many times as it takes. So it's a way of life. Okay, now back to her conversion experience of 1886. She shifted from selfing to sacrifice. Let's take on that notion of sacrifice. Now, if you remember that moment, you just raised up and noticed it, and you returned in your mind kind of a loving glance to somebody or a loving thought. She believed and she knew with all her heart that she was joining that sacrifice of hers, that shift of thought, that shift of emotion, by not going down the chain of hate and anger and all those words from Corinthians, but going in returning charity, utmost charity, as Thomas just taught us, 
She gave love. Okay, she knew that she was joining with our Lord's sacrifice. So it really wasn't even her returning love. She rode, she's so little, she doesn't have anything. So she rode on Jesus' love. She had that experience, she saw this holy card drop out of a book, and she looked at it, and it had um, the, the wounds of Christ open and the, and the blood flowing from the side. And she said, I'll not let any of those drops of blood fall on earth. She's going to hold all suffering and return it. See, it's Christ, as he shed for us. She's going to participate in Christ's redemptive love, bringing it all back to her little flowers. Her little flowers, her little affect. This is very mystical, but it makes all kinds of sense. Um, it's not logical. It is, it is essential. It is mystical. It is hidden. And those of us on the contemplative path understand this because we've already experienced it. So let's get into the notion of sacrifice a little deeper. The sacrifice is not only redemptive of Christ Jesus, returning for all of humankind, but my my sacrifice, my little uno nanosecond, can change somebody else, can substitute somebody else's suffering. My little emotional sacrifice can offset those children in Russia who's, who were killed in that school, can offset the problems at Baghdad, can offset the Palestinian, can offset. We really believe, she really believed that this was her missionary charism, that her little way could change the hearts of many, bring them all to Christ. And we would say, substitute of suffering, meaning when I suffer and I don't waste that suffering and I don't contribute to the suffering of others, I can substitute the suffering that I have for the sake of another. And that means not only is that suffering ennobled and sanctified in and of itself, transmuted, and I benefit and they benefit, but someone else does not have to suffer. It's substituted. The karmic uh, debt has been paid, and we can stop those violent vibrations through our suffering, through our substitution. And, and it's that substitution notion that when there's a, there has to be a pulse of grace, though, you would actually go out of your way to do the hard thing. You would actually... Uh, want or you would prefer to be humiliated or you would go ahead and put yourself at risk for the sake of another. You know, discipleship costs. And, and it's in this vein that it makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm this monastic dialogue, we're going to have this big dialogue down in uh, New Harmony. And uh, one question we're going to ask is, what's the difference? It's going to be with Muslims. What's the difference between sacrifice and suicide? And this is the difference. It's when it's in faith, and it's prompted by the notion of grace, and it's not us at all. It is, you know, it's the Holy Spirit at work on behalf of another, and our suffering substitutes for another's. It has a totally different character, totally different energy, totally different purpose. Now, you might think that's a little far off, but if the monks and nuns can't take up that question, who's going to? So, you know, and Little Flower, we're praying to her that she would give us those skillful means to do so. So, Now, you probably need a break, and so do I. I'm going to play a little tune while you digest that, and I have a good ending. <laughs> do you want to just stand up while I play another tune? know some French tunes, but <laughs> or isn't she rich? And this afternoon you can uh, ask questions about how to contextualize that, how to use the little way as a skillful means uh, in your practice that you've been doing, your, your uh, welcoming practices, your, 
your active prayer, your Lexa Divina. See, you can tell, how did I get so deep into Therese? Well, it was through Alexa Divina. I just took her autobiography for about, how long do you think it took? Uh -huh, a couple years. Mm -hmm. And I'd already studied her and written Tools Matter, so it was after my superficial <laughs> study. I mean, she drew me back for this deeper layer. And that's what Lexio Divina is, to go under the river and into the heart of it, and then to bring it back out, and then see it in your own life. See it in your own life. It is no longer just a teaching out there someplace. It is a way. It is a way. Now I'd like to um, go a little bit more into why Therese, if she's not a saint to be um, you know, loved and patronized and all that, where does she come in now? Because she's dead. Her body kind of went around not too long ago. Anybody see her body? Anybody go? Yeah, a couple of you went. Mm -hmm. Pretty powerful, wasn't it? People came from all over. She said she was going to do her heaven, uh, spend her heaven doing good. And believe me, she does. Believe me, she does. Now, what was that about? Was that a money-making scheme? No, I think they lost money. I don't know. <laughs> it's because we are incarnated. In other words, we have a body. So a real live person that does something that we want to do does matter to us. This is not an idea. It's not a philosophical system. It's not uh, how historical. It's in our time. It's in our space. It's in our face. So we need to know that somebody has done this ahead of us, and, and so there is some reverence. If she were here, what would she say of herself? And she would uh, say this. She says, I would be your bodhisattva. Now, I'm taking this from the Buddhist tradition, but I think it works. A bodhisattva, you know, is um, in the Mahayana tradition, um, the oldest Buddhist tradition, the goal was enlightenment. And should anybody become enlightened, everybody becomes enlightened, and all the cultures would end up in nirvana, and it'd just be a matter of lifetimes. So the, the great Sakyamuni Buddha, um, you know, taught about millions of lifetimes, you become enlightened, and everybody's a Buddha, and there's a Buddha nature within, and you're enlightened. Okay, now the Mahayana people came along a few centuries later, and they said, well, you know, I'm not satisfied to go to another realm if there's not everybody I know and love. All sentient beings of this realm have to come with me. There's a social dimension, a social dynamic, which is inherent in our Christian tradition of ecclesial. We believe that we are a we. We are intimately connected. The waters of baptisms are of a people, not just individuals, not an in individual initiation. So Therese, if she were a bodhisattva, this is what I would know about her because of knowing more about the teachings of a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva is someone who truly has not gone on to the next realm. Not really. She is not gone and out there and up there. Nor is she just a patron to pray for too so that your life would go better. She's not an advocate for you. Nor is she your guardian angel to just whisper this, whisper that and uh, be, you know, prevent uh, disasters and accidents and relationships or to help you get over the ones you already have. Um, so a guardian angel is not her story either. A bodhisattva is someone who is still in the realm. She comes back to the realm in which we live, but in a subtle form, very subtle form. She comes in the form of her teachings. She comes in the form of those teachings. They are clear. They are direct. For somebody only living till age 24, someone only being in the monastery nine years, for somebody only being awake for less than nine years, uh, she's amazing. They're clear. They're compelling. But secondly, not only is it stored in those teachings as dharma or as teachings in Christ's teachings, there is a transmission. There is a transmission through her writings, through her teachings, through me today to you. In other words, there's an energy that comes through that has nothing to do with me, everything to do with what those teachings are to effect. It's closer to our sacramental system. They affect what they signify. So in other words, if you want to be a little, if you want to do the little way, then you can. And you just invoke her name and her way, study it just a little bit with some Lexio, put it on in your life, it'll be yours. It'll be yours. And she will sustain you. 
and, she, the, and the more of a rascal you are, the better she loves you. <laughs> she loves rascals. She loves priests. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> I had a teaching all prepared at this place I was going to give at a monastery, and the abbot said, none of that here. <laughs> now, let's get at Why would she be so attracted to the people who are more sinners than the people that are gracious? She said, everyone will find uh, my little way skillful, or they'll find something in my biography. Everyone will find something there, except those who are looking for something extraordinary. Every, anybody looking for extraordinary grace, forget it. But anybody looking for a path through the ordinary, to be loving through the ordinary, I'm there for you. So it's ordinary. So again, a bodhisattva, someone who is a transmission for you. Now again, I'm going to use the Dalai Lama as an example. He's considered to be a bodhisattva. And when he is in the room, everyone does sit taller. There's no question about it. I've watched... You know, we're waiting for him to come in, and he'll come in the back, you know, and bow and all that stuff and all the pageantry. But I'll watch each person's spine go up. You know, that energy rises, and there's more light in everybody's eyes. The whole energy of the room. Did you find that, Gail? It was higher. You know, a bodhisattva can raise up just through their very person, their emanation. And uh, Therese can do that for you. Now, Therese also would say if you were in need of God's mercy, you made a mistake, as we do countless times. She would say, that what's against the little way is to do any analysis. Oh, why did I do that? Any self-chastisement? Any um, anger thoughts towards the self? Any self-hate? She would say, of course that's me. Who do I expect? You know, so just a little sense of humor and go back. You know, but any of that other is against the little way. It's against being little, isn't it? It's kind of a form of vainglory or dejection. So when you're really little, of course you screw up. Of course I'm angry with that. But I don't have to act on it. And then to invoke the little way, to practice returning love, returning the affect of love, and to use my suffering as substituting for somebody else's suffering. So that's, that's a very powerful teaching with her. Is to understand little does mean faulty. And those are the skillful means. Our faults become the skillful means. So our afflictions, her foreness, her, her over-dependency on af- affection and esteem and, and wanting to be loved uh, was her way. But it wasn't to go up the chain of getting it. It's the chain of, of, of negating it. So we, we're backing out of it, backing out of the emotional thing. Now, this makes sense. If you see what she defines love is, if charity, charity is her vocation, love is her vocation, then what is love? And if she has emotional apathetism, everybody get that? Isn't that a great word? Yeah. So she backs out of her emotions and she offers love, then what is love? Love is two things. Love is prayer, because this is done in prayer. Because if you don't do it in prayer, you're doing it winning somebody's approval or love in another way, you know. So in other words, prayer means God mediates. So it's offered to God. Those are the flowers to God. It's worship. It's adoration. So, so it's, you use, instead of like, you know, your sacred thought where you ever so gently return to that word, ever so gently and, you know, go back to, you know, that sense of God's presence, and ever so gently thoughts rise, and you lay on the word. Okay, her emotions would rise, and she would return those negative emotions with love. And then how did she know how to love? It was only through prayer. And what she did was, her skillful means was, she asked the Holy Spirit. She would descend her mind into her heart and say, should I chastise this novice, or shall I tell her my story, or shall I just hold the line and keep the rules? So she had a very discerning heart. She discerned in her heart how to love that person. You know, some people did not need just affirmation. They needed confrontation. There's a charming story in there of a a woman, a nun, eight years older than herself, who was denigrating the prioress, the abbess. Now, I'm partial to that. (laughs) But Benedict calls that murmuring because it does corrode. It's the cancer of common life, you know, where everybody's negative and it just grows and grows and grows. Well, anyway, so they used to have these holy conversations, and, and they had been de- degenerating into negativity sessions. 
So Therese prayed about it, and so she was in the parlor with this nun and they had their time set. And uh, she decided she'd confront this nun. And it's just charming the way she says it in there. She says, I was crying. She could tell I was crying. So I took her head. Now, here's some little nun, eight years younger than the other nun, and put her head on my bosom, she says. I thought, wow, that's great. And she said, you know, we can't talk that way. And they both cried. And that nun already knew what she was going to confront her with in love. And so they both kind of said a new thing. So in other words, in love, she confronted this older nun with emotion, with passion, with feeling, with affect. I don't know about you, but I don't have any nuns bringing my head to their bosom in the parlor. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the sensitivity to her to just be that loving, that open, that generous. Catherine, how about your parlor? <laughs> no. Anyway, we're both Benedictines. Anyway, we're still so verbal. We're so, in other words, we can do it with our emotions, with our affect, if indeed we've backed out our negativity, see? So that's her skillful means, her skillful means of being loving. So back to the definition of what is love. Love is, first of all, prayer. I don't even know how to love. So Christ Jesus, the Spirit's got to show me what's the loving thing for this person. And then secondly, it has to be sacrifice. Sacrifice. I have to surrender myself. What do I sacrifice really? Because sometimes I'll get a good meal out of it. You know, so sometimes it really looks like I'm getting more. But the whole point is I sacrifice myself. So she is the highest example of self-renunciation. Renunciation of the self. You know, she renounced herself selfing. She renounced herselfing over and over and over again as a skillful means of love, her vocation was love, and then she offered it as a missionary to all of us here in this room, to all of us forever, to um, substitute her suffering for the sake of others. And not only that, she would transmute and transform her suffering and transmute and transform my suffering, but because of her suffering, I don't have to suffer as much. Or when I do suffer, I can reduce the suffering of others. So it's a very powerful thing. Very, very powerful thing. I have one more little thing. Um, isn't she good? Isn't she good? Let's take on just a few examples of, of this kind of love, this kind of little way, because it is a distinctive way. Now, anytime you pick up a way, a practice, a pattern, you, you, um, if it's your way, if it's God calling you to this way, you don't do other ways. You don't crowd it with other kinds of practices. So in Teresa's life, she did not get up earlier. She did not, she was not a scholar. She was not, she was not anything but this little way. And she was novice mistress. But you know that she wasn't even a voting member of their chapter because they didn't want too many Martins to uh, make the next election a slam dunk. <clears throat> so, I mean, again, her way was just these emotions. And so she did not do other ways that other Carmelite sisters would do, you know, uh, scholarly writing or uh, more corporal punishment or, um, you know, even teaching others. I mean, she, hers was through little. So the point isn't so much to do her little way, uh, you know, but it's to find what is the little way for you. So each one of us has a little way that does negate other ways. So in other words, we can't go every direction. And so I'd like to take a moment on how this fits in with centering prayer, because that's a common practice among all of us in this room. Centering prayer is an ingenious, thank you, Thomas, and those of you that have stewarded it all these years, it's an ingenious way of stilling our thoughts and um, coming to the presence of God ever so gently, and then letting God be God in our hearts, and just being content to be in that presence. And then, then when we awaken, it's a form. It's a very formal way. It's a sitting way. It's got form. It's got content. It's got practice. And it brings us below the river so that we know we have thoughts. We know we have affection. We have feelings. We have afflictions. So when we get up, we're in the ordinary consciousness. We're above the river. And so it's up above the river that you're going to need another way for consciousness because you can't return to centering prayer because the, if there's a red light, there's a green light, you gotta go, <laughs> you know, they're two different, they are, they're doing two different things, but it's not mutually incompatible. 
When you center, you center. When you rise and you're ordinary, now you need another practice that you talked about on Thursday. You need something, a default practice for your everyday consciousness. And that's what the little way would provide for you. Um, or any of those other ways, and maybe through God's grace you can integrate these ways. But it's in your ordinary consciousness that you have a default place to bring your mind, just like in your centering prayer, you have a default place to bring your thoughts. You know, you let them go through that gentle device of the sacred word. And so you have that home base. You take refuge in that sacred word, you know, or using the sacred word. It's not even the content of the word, as you know. Now, what is the little way? Well, it's taking refuge and using my feelings, my affection, my irritations, my afflictions, my mental egoic programs, my attachments, and not going up the chain of them, but but backing out of them so that I can return to my vocation, which is love, and then I can sacrifice myself in my ordinary consciousness, I don't want myself at the center. I want God at the center, so prayer is my center, presence. And then through prayer, offering, my action, my apostolate, is sacrifice. Two examples, and I will close. One example, when I teach this, uh, and, and those of you that have come to Beach Grove, is my brother Edward. And uh, he's now a nurse, but he's a very special guy, just a year younger than me recently diagnosed um, manic-manic, you know, bipolar manic-manic. Now, they could have asked his older sister (laughs) about age two. I would have told him, but it took him until he was 57 to catch on that he really needed medication because, you know, for for openers, he'd say, you want to go bike riding? Well, 26 miles later, I I wanted to go home, you know. (laughs) So he was just really a a very active boy. Now... um, I went to school at age three, might tell you something, because it couldn't handle him. But I'm a good student today, so, you know. But anyway, Edward uh, had crashed all kinds of ways. He's gay, he's manic, he's manic, manic, he's uh, just crashed. You know, he was uh, end of his lots of careers, very successful, very bright, but also couldn't sustain it. That's what happens in bipolarity, you know. And so um, he crashed and came back to me, really, because I was the only one living in Indiana. So here I had my brother. And uh, so to make a long story short, he's lived there in Indianapolis. He decided to go into nursing school. And he, uh, Loretta Young had introduced him to the little way. Believe it or not, that Loretta Young, that was her way. You know, the actress Loretta Young, Edward wrote her story. Well, anyway, so he became a nurse. And here's this 58-year-old guy in all the nurses' classes with all these women, really, the only guy in most of the classes, and learning. Edward has law degrees and political science and commodities, but here he was learning OBGYN and, you know, and all the f- stuff. But anyway, Ed practiced the little way all the way through, and he'll tell you that he's a nurse today, and he'll tell you about the latest patient. He uses nursing as his foil, really, He just, it's a way to be next to the patient. And he'll talk about a very anxious patient. Now he works in um, psychiatric pediatric at Methodist Hospital. And, uh, you know, little kids would be acting out, and he'd pick them up and just gently put them down. And and he'd pat them on the head, and he said, I do the little way with each child that comes in, the little way. So my work is a little way. I just happen to be a nurse. I just happen to be working in psychiatric pediatric. So you see how this works? The end of the river is our real work. What is the work of the monastery? What is the work of contemplatives? It's a little way. It's, it's the contemplative way of life. And then we find form above the river to skillfully export or to minister or to reach out according to the impulse of the Holy Spirit. And God gives us the grace to do so. So is that good or what? Yeah. Well, with that, I'm going to play uh, that first song. I like that one. I, I played it in church recently, and they said, never again. <laughs> they said that so many men before, or something like that, reminded too many people of too many things. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you.